Good day, everyone. Uh, our sincere uh, uh, thanks for all of you for attending this uh, very interesting CME and a kind of public awareness program on a burning topic, uh, monkeypox. Uh, let the foremost uh, would like to uh, say our thanks to ICC Hyderabad for uh, giving us the opportunity. And uh, next, uh, we have an extreme panel of uh, like uh, very dignified ac academicians. To start with, Dr. Samyadam Srinivas, sir, the Vice President of ISCCM and the Head of Virinchi Hospitals. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, followed by Dr. Venkatramna, sir, uh, Head of Critical Care Medicine, Eshwada Group of Hospitals, uh, and National Executive Committee Member of Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, thank you, sir. And Dr. Vishnu, uh, Senior Consultant, Infectious Diseases. And uh, uh, thank you, Vishnu, for attending this uh, like interesting discussion and uh, sparing your time. And myself, Dr. Deepak, uh, Consultant in Critical Care from Apollo Hospital. Uh, so going into the panel discussion, today our topic is uh, monkeypox. So you must have been hearing all through your uh, news channels, uh, newspapers, and people might be talking about uh, this topic. So what is this monkeypox? And uh, uh, to start with Dr. Vishnu, uh, what exactly is this, Dr. Uh, Vishnu? What is this monkeypox and why is it actually so much of issues going on around you? Uh, see, basically the term monkeypox actually... Um... Uh, it's it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, basically, the virus, uh, uh, you know, which actually belongs to uh, a pox virus, it's, it's going to belong to a family of pox virus, which basically actually uh, the virus is reservoir in most of the rodents actually. But the first time it was detected was in monkeys. So they named it as monkey pox. Uh, it's not that this occurs only in the monkeys and uh, that not that that's not the reason it was first identified in the monkeys so they named it as monkeypox and uh, the primary reservoir is actually rodents from there this virus can spill into humans it can spill into monkeys it can spill into other animals and uh, you know you can get the disease if you come in contact directly with this uh, you know uh, reservoir host or with the animals which are having this infection that's how we're going to get the disease and that's what is monkeypox and I believe, I think we never heard before about this one. Why are we hearing so much about uh, this monkeypox in these days? Okay. Actually, this particular disease is endemic in the Western and Central Africa. So most of the outbreaks uh, uh, before, uh, you know, 2021, there most of the outbreaks were actually confined to Western and Central Africa. Uh, but later on, uh, uh, and that too, these are all, uh, uh, th these used to come in outbreaks or sporadic cases. Uh, especially in these particular areas, when you have a common contact with the animal, when you have a contact, the index case with the contact with the animal, and then the close contacts used to get. That's what it used to happen. The other way was it like when the you know person who travels to the endemic areas and get the disease. And the third way was before is that you know through uh, 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 importing of the exotic animals. For example, in 2021, the outbreak what was there in US is because of the import. Uh, because of the imported perry dogs, which were in contact with these reservoirs, which acquired this disease. And from there, these perry dogs were actually taken as pets. And from there, it spilled into the humans. This is how it used to happen. But in this particular outbreak, it is completely different. It is mainly through the sexual route of transmission. Mind you, monkeypox, you can get it through direct contact, respiratory secretion. But what is unique in this particular outbreak is the predominance of sexual transmission. This is, this is supported by the fact that most of the case presentations, what we have, most of the data, what we have is predominantly seen in the sexually transmitted in the homosexual population. And the likely route of transmission is sexual route. Uh, so in fact, that's the reason the lesions are very unusual. Typically the monkeypox lesion we used to see on the face, palms and soles, but this in this outbreak is most of them are around the genital area, perianal area, uh, uh, so here are, we are seeing more and more lesions. So the thing that is different now is the sexual transmission predominantly in the homosexual group of population because the virus is even present in the semen along with the other tracts, what I was told already. Thank you. Uh, Samidam, sir, uh, like uh, we have been, as uh, the prior panelist has told, I think uh, this, uh, we are hearing uh, I'm like about this monkey pause recently. I'm like, how did it start? And I'm like, we have been seeing daily in the newspaper that the cases load in the, like India is going up. And yesterday, I think I've seen that the ninth case is also recorded. Uh, where exactly is going? And uh, is it true, sir, the news channels are creating so much I mean, like news about it? The, um, I think the COVID pandemic has nearly created a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, apprehension and fear amongst everybody. 
Initially, we thought when the COVID pandemic started, uh, wherever it started in the world, that it won't reach Indian uh, shores. We were confident that if you uh, lock down, if you cut down international travel, you can protect your own population from a big outbreak of the COVID pandemic. And we were proven wrong. And a lot of lives, valuable lives, young productive lives were lost in the process. <clears throat> so that has resulted in a little bit of a phobia or a fear amongst all of us that something new, just as even even as we are battling the fourth wave of COVID, uh, still we have seen 20,000 cases in the country every day. You have another thing that can be transmitted and what you hear from and, uh, and read about it is that it is transmissible from person to person. The incubation period is five days. Isolation period is 21 days. So when you hear that information, this information uh, from various sources, you tend to worry about it. Uh, so I think that's the reason why, but I cannot draw a comparison between the kind of mayhem and havoc that COVID wrecked on our population and on the overall health when compared to the monkeypox. For the simple reason, I would reassure the people who are listening that it is a transmissible disease. It can go from human to human contact, but it's a self-limiting disease. It's not as fatal as severe form of COVID-19, at least as of now. So yes, it is the responsibility of the news channels to get us information to ensure that our vigilance does not you know, uh, lag behind. This is a disease which is a preventable disease if you have follow proper precautions. So the media is doing its role in getting the information across to us. How we assimilate it, how we react to it is entirely in our hands. Thank you, sir. Uh, I've seen um, like yesterday that there, this ninth case was recorded in the India. Uh, could you please trace us how, how are the cases actually isolated? I've seen some patients were the travelers, some patients didn't have the actual history of contact. What happened to them? See, uh, as I know, as, as I can see that there were five patients in one state, that's in Kerala, and uh, four in Delhi, right? That's how it is at this point of time. There were a couple of patients uh, who were suspected to have mon monkeypox even in our state, but the sub subsequent serological tests have proven negative. Now, all these patients uh, reported from K Kerala have had travel uh, to uh, the Gulf or have had contact with people who have traveled to the Gulf. The fact you need to remember is unlike other uh, viral exams, like a chickenpox, for example, or even COVID-19, for example, the, the, your incubation period is as long as five days. So you will forget with whom you have actually come into contact. So you would have forgotten. You would have flown in from somewhere. You would have, and if you have flown into an international airport, right, you don't know who sat, uh, as Vishnu said, this is something that is related to body fluids. And you don't know uh, who has sat uh, in, uh, your, in, the, in the seat or chair where you are sitting right now, a few minutes ago. And it's also a droplet spread. So you don't know the uh, atmosphere in which you're circulating, especially if you're transiting through international airports. So I personally believe that maybe some of them, couple of them probably would have had person-to-person -person contact. But out of the nine we reported in this country, I think seven have had either history of travel or have come into contact with somebody who's traveled from these uh, countries. Thank you, sir. So still, we could have a theory that uh, it's not a very alarming spread as of now. See, if I say that, uh, everybody will be casual about it, and uh, it will blow up on our face. So I would only say that we should all be vigilant, but we should not panic. Now, panic essentially leads to wrong decisions and knee-jerk reactions, uh, and you know what happened in the first wave of, of COVID. Uh, we disowned our own people. That kind of a reaction should not happen. You should be vigilant that this is an infectious disease. It can have a long recovery phase, but at the same time, we should be more uh, balanced and calm in handling it. Thank you, sir. Venkat, sir, uh, how exactly the symptoms of the monkeypox starts, and uh, like what are the how does the actual patients appear for us? Can you please elaborate? So, um, in this current, uh, as um, both the panelists were explaining in from 2021, when we are seeing non-endemic areas having some clusters of cases, uh, many had uh, some uh, contact travel history, many we could not track. 
uh, there were a lot of debates related to a local uh, kind of a chronic spread also, but uh, these are all assumptions which are still yet to be proven. But the presentation, clinical presentation, uh, again, tend to be the like constitutional general symptoms like high grade fever, uh, general body ache, then back pain, headache will be common like any other uh, viral illness which we see. The peculiarity which has been seen with uh, particularly this uh, monkeypox related uh, illness is there were a swollen glands, particularly lymph node swelling has been more common in particularly prodermal states where you see this fever, headache and uh, the body pains. In the same time, they see a uh, enlarged lymph nodes. So probably that is one uh, single cue which differentiate it from the other kind of viral common fevers which we say day in and out. Followed by the rash. Uh, and this rash spreads from the face and more predominantly on the soles and palm, contrary to the other rash illnesses which we see in the dengue or other recursial diseases, the torso, the body is uh, been also, trunk has been also involved. But here the face and the sole and palms are been the common, followed by mucous membrane. The mucous membrane as pointed out by uh, Dr. Vishnu, not just the oral cavity or the throat, but also the genitalia both uh, the uh, anal canal and the uh, uh, genitalia have been included with ulceration. So I think these are the initial symptoms and these RAS, which actually uh, follows to be a vesicles, those are fluid filled uh, lesions and they initially may have a clear fluid followed by a turbid fluid, which we say can be a purulent. And they, I, all of these, uh, most of them are self-limiting provided they get into any complication like any uh, 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 kind of other Fox illnesses or varicella, which we see, and they slowly get into a dried crust and uh, these caps actually dry up and fall down. So this is the typical uh, symptoms which we see. And uh, it varies probably as uh, uh, Dr. Vishnu was mentioning, uh, all may not have the similar kind of symptoms, maybe few of uh, them. Uh, right now, what we have seen with European uh, information that the most cases were detected in STD clinics. That is a men sex to men clinics where uh, the pickup was high, but that was not the trend what we have seen in India right now. So it probably varies from a geographic to geographic location also. Thank you, sir. Dr. Vishnu, your take on this? Yeah. Uh, so that's what uh, it depends. So the clinical symptoms going to depend on the type of transmission. See, because previous this transmission, this currently the NEGM paper or the BMG paper, they all, you know, they published 430 cases and 197 cases. In them, 99% are MSMs. Actually, there are hardly any female patient. It's all male patients and most of them is sexual transmission. And in this case series, what was published, more than 95% of the skin lesions are in the genital area and perineal area which means that whatever the transmission happened there is predominantly a sexual mode of transmission in MSM. And that's the reason we are seeing the lesions more there. Uh, uh, but when you come to India, see, if, if, the, if, if it comes in more of a sexually, you know, sexually active group like MSM and all, probably we see all these lesions. But if the transmission is through contact or droplet or because of the close contact in the family members, we may not see so many genital lesions. So I'm going to suspect a case based on the, not only the genital lesions, but also, you know, if the, you have this, you know, umbilicated pustular lesions on the face, palms and soles. So if it is non-sexual transmission, probably the lesions we tend to see more on the face, hands and soles. If it is a sexual transmission, we're going to see more in the genital area and plus, of course, along with the palms and soles. So it probably the symptoms, what we see depends on the type of transmission. Right. So from what I understand, uh, both of you are saying any in this, uh, um, like if there's an endemic region, it's a different ball game. But if there's a history of travel or history of contact, any new fever with high grade manifestation and the new set of un, um, like kind of uh, unusual rash, you need to suspect the, this kind of disease. At the same time, uh, the MSM group and those people, they are likely to actually reach the healthcare more, uh, I think, frequently rather than the other groups that they don't be much more suspicion. From what I've read, uh, sir, some of them, sir, as they both told, what are the other illnesses which you can might mix? I've seen a lot of people now sending me WhatsApp pictures of uh, this rash, that rash, so rash and uh, this one, so which were subsequently turned out to be some other illnesses. So just to reassure the public, what are the other illnesses which can manifest like this? 
It's uh, one of the typical manifestations of any viral disease is an exanthematous rash, right? There are macular diseases, there are maculopapular rashes, there are vesicular rashes. The most commonly known disease which produces vesicular eruptions is your common varicella infection, chickenpox, right? Right. So just like, uh, you know, if you have a patient with community acquired pneumonia, uh, strep pneumonia is still the most common organism. If you have a viral exanthem uh, with uh, vesicular uh, involvement, um, it is uh, most likely that it is a varicella infection. So, and the duration of the myalgia, the duration of the, the febrile prodrome is very, very short in patients with other viral exanthems. But the key aspect, as Venkat said in the early part of the present, uh, this discussion, is that lymph node enlargement is seen in very, very few viral exanthems to the extent that you see in monkeypox. Infectious mononucleosis is one such disease where you get this kind of lymphadenopathy. But that rash is a different flat uh, uh, you know, uh, a erythema multiforme kind of rash. Whereas this is a very raised hard, uh, rash with painful lymph nodes uh, happening for a long time. Infectious mononucleosis comes with a lot of features, but its peak is within the first one week. It tends to ebb after that. Whereas these lesions start at the end of fifth day, and then they continue till, the, uh, uh, till 21 days. The scabbing and falling off of the crust of monkeypox happens in second week afterwards, whereas the scabbing and falling off in varicella and other exanthems happens at the end of the first week. So if your rash is not subsiding, your lymph nodes are enlarged, they're painful, and the scabbing has not started at the end of first week, then you think that probably what you have is monkeypox. But waiting for one week, it's very difficult to convince people not to think of monkeypox. And as you said, every day you read in the newspaper, you see on WhatsApp, you open Facebook, uh, you, you hear it. So, you know, you, you get morbidly obsessed and scared about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Vishnu, uh, when we see who are the actual persons who are at the risk of catching this monkeypox, what? Uh, see, uh, as I told, the, it depends on the mode of spread, you know, uh, as I told, the mode of spread is, you know, respiratory droplets and uh, close contact fomites and the sexual transmission is what newly detected. So, you know, uh, somebody who is in close contact, you know, those are the people who are going to get it. See, at least what is good about monkeypox compared to SARS-CoV is the secondary attack rate is only 9%. If it is in SARS, if it is say, if you take measles and all, it is as high as 90%. What it essentially means that uh, uh, if it's 100 susceptible population are exposed to measles, 90 will develop. If 100 susceptible population of monkeypox are exposed, only 9 develop. What it essentially means that at least it is not as transmissible as the other things. It is less transmissible. So for you to get monkeypox, you should have a close prolonged contact. I know. So uh, at least that is good with monkeypox. So, and those who are at high risk, most of the times it is a self-limiting disease, but it can be high risk if any susceptible groups get infected. For example, infants, pregnant, somebody who is immunocompromised, uh, elderly age group. So probably these are the group who are the susceptible group. They can have a severe disease, but most of the times it is self-resolving illness. The case series, which was published from the U uh, 16 countries in NEGM paper or BMG, there are no mortalities at all. Uh, even, and even the mortalities which were happened till now, actually they are in the African countries and it is very difficult to really think why the mortality is because most of the time there, there is no proper access to the healthcare there. So it appears to be mortality to be very low. Uh, and I, I heard that there is one mortality in our country, but we clearly don't know why that is. I didn't really see why it is there. They label it as encephalitis, but is it because of monkeypox causing encephalitis is extremely rare. Is there any other co-infection and all? Still, we really do not know. We need to get that data out. Then we can say why that. But as such, mortality is very less. And the risk groups are, which are already I have told. Thank you. So that actually comes to the question, Venkat, sir. Uh, as Vishnu uh, has rightly said, uh, the smaller age groups, the children, uh, pregnant ladies, a very extreme sub-age group, geriatric group, they seem to be more susceptible. That's what they say. Uh, like in the COVID, I think, are the other people who are having uh, poor diabetic control, hypertension, heart diseases, kidney diseases, the, are they more prone for the worsening of uh, monkeypox, sir? See, I think at this point of time, our understanding is it is a self-limiting disease. 
So it should uh, uh, the whole uh, our immune system should take care of it. But as uh, uh, Vishnu pointed out, the reasons why these patients worsen are probably the complications related to either a secondary secondary infections or a general supportive care is not been adequately provided as we are talking about a resource limited country or sometimes like what we see with other viral illness like what you see is varicella or any other illnesses where you also develop something called uh, uh, pneumonia or a pneumonitis, viral pneumonia or a pneumonitis or a encephalitis or a multi-system involvement in them which may lead to uh, a fatal outcomes if there is no adequate support support system available in them. So I, I believe key the like a extreme age groups, immunocompromised host, or any of those patients who had a medical conditions, as you mentioned, a list of uncontrolled diabetes or any other conditions, will always carry a risk of these complexities in this group. So other than that, I don't find any other reasons to actually link them. But yes, to have a complexities over a general viral uh, illness will be more in them. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was already told by the previous speakers the mode of spread of this disease, like bodily fluids, the prolonged uh, contact with the persons who are having disease. Uh, coming to the next question, quickly going to some of them, sir. Um, like, uh, what are the precautions uh, one needs to take uh, to prevent from this disease as a person, as an individual, at, at a community level? Mm -hmm. See, the only way you can protect yourself from this disease is to isolate the person who is suspected to have this disease. Now, that isolation is not just, uh, you know, for on paper. It has to be completely in a separate location. The person has to avoid contact with everybody. Um, uh, and, that, and it's over a prolonged period of time. And if you have symptoms uh, and you have travel, you have traveled or you have transited through an international airport and you have symptoms, you have painful swelling in behind your ears. The most common sites where this lymphadenopathy happens is the genital in the groin and behind the ears. So if you have any painful swelling in the groin or behind the ears, you have a fever, you have a rash, take help. Don't uh, feel uh, you know hesitant to seek help. Get into isolation, either institutional or home-based isolation and stay away from everybody for three weeks, at least till the scabs start falling off. That's when you tend to become non-infective to others. So every single person has to be disciplined himself. Otherwise, we'll end up with the same problem which we had with COVID. Thank you, sir. Uh, you rightly said about the person who has developed some symptoms. What about the persons uh, who are afraid of getting into the, for example, I'm traveling in an airplane to some station or something with family. What are the precautions I need to take? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know as of now. But yeah, wearing a mask may help, may not help, but it's always better to wear one. Um, keep physical distancing uh, and uh, have, wash your hands as frequently as you can. Right, sir. Uh, another question from one of the um, like audiences. I think they started the, sending the school, children to schools recently and they heard that this disease is more severe in the children. So what actually are the realistic expectations? I don't think they should be worried because the school children are less likely to ex be exposed to the kind of population which Vishnu actually alluded to uh, repeatedly uh, to assure people that there's a specific subset of people with a specific behavioral pattern who are more susceptible for this disease. Uh, yes, it is important for the teachers in the schools to be aware that this is a disease, uh, they should watch out, uh, not only for the students, but for the visitors who come to the school. The parents should drop the children off to school, the drivers should drive in their cars, or the, the cab drivers should drop the children at school. So there should be vigilance, but I don't think we should be, yes, the disease is worse in children. But I mean, in a country like ours where uh, monkeypox is non-endemic, Children to get affected is a far-fetched uh, thing at this point of time. I hope I'm right. Uh, Dr. Vishnu, uh, I would like uh, this actually, uh, what actually, for example, I have a suspicion of uh, new onset of fever. I still have a suspicion of monkeypox. What are the samples they take from me? 
uh, for any individual, what kind of uh, tests they will do, uh, both Venkat sir and you can take this question. Yeah, see, first of all, it's the, always the suspicion. Whenever somebody has fever or this unusual looking rash or they have typical history of travel or coming in contact with somebody who is suspected to monkeypox, you know, they should come and meet the healthcare worker or the doctor. Don't, don't try to treat yourself at home. Come to the doctor and give the proper history. And once the doctor suspects it, currently what has been done is that, uh, you know, uh, the people whoever are suspects are being sent to Nalakunta Fever Hospital and there the people are isolated and from there the samples are sent. Uh, and the, typically the samples, what we are going to send is, is the direct skin samples, that is the skin lesions. We're going to take a spa scalpel and incise it and take that infected material, purulent material, we send for PCR. And we'll send also the oral, oral, oropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal swab, blood. All these samples will be sent for NIV to Pune. And till the diagnosis is back, we're going to, you know, keep the patient isolated. Thank you. Uh, Venkat sir, anything to add? I think uh, uh, we are still following uh, the uh, district surveillance, state surveillance and central surveillance unit flow. And we do not have any uh, special uh, state surveillance uh, or a state uh, government, uh, any regulatory or a guidelines. We are following the central one. And right now, yes, uh, uh, we uh, use the fever hospital as a center to actually capture these clusters. And from there, the sample goes to NIV. And initially, the sample they screen is PCR for pox virus. And then once if it is positive, then again, they go for a monkey pox. Or they are also doing a sequencing to confirm it. So that's the flow which we are following. Uh, and the add-on thing, is, I think also we send the fluid, the vesicular fluid along with the base or uh, the roof or the oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal swabs. And uh, the key is suspicion. I think as Vishnu pointed out, uh, the all healthcare professionals right now uh, in Telangana or in Hyderabad or in this city should be more vigilant. And uh, we at the community level, we at the healthcare level need to be vigilant to have a suspicion. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, uh, question to you and uh, Samvedam, sir, actually. Uh, how realistic is the possibility that the people can get sick admitted to the ICUs and uh, if at all they get sick, what are the causes of death in these patients? Sir? So I, I think the same question which uh, we were discussing in the previous part also, uh, the most of the complications, uh, see when we say it is a self-limiting and the fatality as uh, Dr. Vishnu was pointing out in the BMJ in the recent article, they said there was no uh, documented deaths in that series from the so-called developed world uh, documented, but we have seen uh, the fatality rate varied between somewhere between four to 11% in the African countries in the last maybe 50 years or so. And uh, we also seen to happen uh, one death in Kerala where one of the sample of the patient died the patient sample turned to be positive from NIV Pune. And this patient again had a travel history to the Gulf. And the patient had a typical, uh, I think, clinical uh, syndrome, which was fitting to a monkey pox. But what was the exact cause of the death in that patient was not uh, clear uh, in, in that particular case. But what we typically look for the uh, uh, reason for the death in these cases is if these patients land up into the secondary infections, which is quite possible when your lesions from a few to can get into a few thousands, the lesions of the skin uh, lesions get into a few thousand. And if they have some underlying comorbidities as extreme of age, or uh, you have any um, underlying add-on immunocompromised host or any underlying uh, uncontrolled uh, chronic diseases, and these patients can land up into the complications of secondary bacterial infection. And uh, sometimes the pneumonia, Sometimes encephalitis, sometimes multisystem involvement in them can lead to the fatality. I personally feel uh, if we see a difference from uh, the what we see in the developed world of these uh, few hundred cases to what happened to few thousand cases in the Africa, the care or the supportive care or the general care which is available at a uh, uh, at a at a better level in these uh, parts of the world is the difference. Uh, I feel in that way. Thank you, sir. Uh, Samyagam, sir, uh, if at all, if someone gets a monkeypox, uh, the, what is the like few conditions or maybe few actually signs where they need to get themselves admitted or where they need to go and uh, uh, contact a inpatient center, sir? Mm, see, uh, the whatever little evidence is available from past experiences from endemic area, uh, 
uh, of uh, Africa. There are two clades of this virus. One is the Central African clade, and the other one is the West African clade. Uh, the Central African clade in Congo um, uh, and Central Africa is different from what is found in the Western African countries. The ones in the center of the country died of liver failure, myocarditis, and encephalitis. But that doesn't seem the only country where both these clades uh, are found at the same time is the Democratic Republic of Congo. What we are seeing outside now in the in Europe and uh, elsewhere is the second clade, which is a mild disease, uh, uh, even by their own standards, because there is data from Africa where it is an endemic disease. So, however, if it's not that you die of monkeypox alone, right? You could die of some other disease with concomitant running monkeypox. So if you have itching, which is a characteristic of this disease, with LOIs or your urine, uh, uh, the amount of urine you are putting out every day is coming down, your feet start to swell up, your head aches, or your vision becomes blurred, or you have a double vision, uh, then irrespective of whether this is monkeypox or any other viral exanthem, you need to take help. You can't just take paracetamol and sit at home and expect that in 21 days you will be, you will be okay. So if there has been a contact with a person who's traveled, you have a rash and you have these symptoms, just by assuming that monkeypox is an innocuous disease, don't ignore something that is more easily treatable, like a viral hepatitis, for example, like a malaria, for example, like a dengue, for example. If you are isolated and sitting alone in a room in Hyderabad, it is more likely that you would be bitten by more mosquitoes. So you would get dengue and malaria more than die of monkeypox. So I think uh, if you have symptoms of organ dysfunction, you, you need to take help. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Vishnu, uh, lack of treatment in the first wave of COVID was a real worry at the time, as we were all worried at the time. Uh, what about the actual treatment options available for the monkey positive someone gets? Do we have a treatment? And if at all, is it a costly one or toxic one? Yeah, currently we have uh, three drugs available, um, uh, Cidofovir, uh, Brinsidofovir, Ticovir mat, and varicella, you know, uh, sorry, uh, immunoglobulins, what we have monkeypox, immunoglobulins is what we have. Uh, but, you know, those antivirals out of which only one is available in the country, in our country, what we have is Cidofovir. Uh, see, even if you see the data, even if you see in the, all those multiple case uh, publications, what they are, they have used in extremely few cases. Uh, it's hardly you can, you know, maybe 10 or 20 patients and none of them had any death. So if you ask me how much, how do you, do you have antivirals? Yes, we have available and how much are going to help? We really don't have data because most of the people are getting better on their own. And those whom you, those in whom this drug has been used in the current publication series all have survived. Uh, so coming to the drugs, basically these are not the simple drugs which are available over the counter. What we have in the country is Cidofovir, which is actually a drug which we treat for CMV, which is approved for CMV, adenovirus, or uh, at times we give in BK virus. This is a drug and it's a costlier drug. We give once a week and it is it has some side effects too. Uh, but you know, most since as we are already discussing, it's a self-limiting disease. And maybe we, we may prioritize these two few people who are at extremely high risk groups, as we pointed out, and somebody who has extensive skin lesions who have a progressive disease. Probably these are the people where we may give this drug uh, provided and also, you know, uh, adding a caution that we still don't know, uh, uh, you know, how much these are effective and, uh, you know, we need more data for that. But we have antivirals available out of which one is available in our country. But on a lot larger note, actually needing these antivirals is really low. Is, am I correct? Sorry, I didn't get you. Sorry. Uh, like on a larger note, if an average person who gets a monkeypox, uh, most of them are self-limiting and yes. they may not need this. They may not right? need for most people. Yes, correct. Right. Uh, Venkat sir and Samvedam sir, uh, at the government level, so what are the steps the Indian government is actually taking? And at a state level, what are the steps which are being, which the public needs to be reassured about? Um, health is your own responsibility, right? You can't expect the government to keep you healthy. The government has enough problems on its hands, right? They have malnutrition to fight with. They have anemia amongst pregnant ladies to fight with. They have illiteracy. There are floods happening in the northeast of the country, right? And then still there is COVID, right? COVID has not gone away. We are now looking at uh, monkeypox because we have exhausted talking about COVID. 
<laughs> yeah, no, nothing else to talk about covid so the government does its bit the government has given us advisory the government has cautioned us the government has uh, put out uh, advertisements uh, telling us what to do whether we do it or not is up to us you don't follow what the government is asking you to do and then you you get sick and you expect them to give you infrastructure to treat you that's not act- having said that as venkat already mentioned there is a three tier structure which has been put in place pandemic preparedness in this country is now at a very high level uh, at a very efficient level at this point of time all district and health officers are now uh, aware of how these things are happening how to keep surveillance so both the central and state governments i believe are doing their best to keep us abreast of what's happening and keep as vishnu said the institute of tropical diseases is geared up to look after these patients they are being referred to there they have a tie up with the national institute of virology for screening uh, the government is doing its bit i think it's just up to us to be more disciplined and listen to what they're saying and that's where we messed it up big time with covid i think venkat sir do we have a helpline or something like that where if someone sure. stays at home yeah so if you look at the i was just actually a googling bro when you uh, we had an interaction on this like uh, ki, yeah, the ministry of health have given its guideline uh, on the website if you go cool through there are clear guidelines on which is a uh, suspected case when there is a travel history with typical uh, on the lymph nodes swelling with the rash and the vesicles everywhere and uh, there was again a case like which which we uh, uh, say probable case where there is already a contact history with another confirmed case and there is a confirmed case where the pcr has been positive other than that uh, in the same flow uh, they have written key what are the clinical signs symptoms what are the sample to be sent and then where to send and there have they have given two contact uh, names one is with prayag and the other from niv scientist who will be the contact point with the phone number with a mail id with an office address of niv pune which is available on ministry of health with icms collaboration uh, website and uh, the sample from where you to send is as uh, samvedan sir was also mentioning from district to state to a central there is a link uh, connected of the surveillance process there are also guidelines for the surveillances where they are talking about std clinics they are talking about pediatrics clinics where these patients may come up as a opd based uh, uh, help for uh, varicella like presentations or uh, presentation with some kind of uh, rash uh, which is not going up as uh, been pointed out so these all uh, need to be um, uh, keeping a vigilant watch and informing the authorities so i think there is a flow available and all these uh, uh, samples which will be sent are not chargeable and they are free of cost and the containers are available sampling methods are available and it will be sent to niv pune including not the first uh, uh, step but uh, uh, not the first step of just doing a pcr for a pox virus but followed by sequencing all are been done in, in at, a, at a free of cost by the government of india uh, at a national level thank you sir uh, dr vishnu uh, we taken the first covid vaccine second vaccine both taken a booster and uh, some of them are take the fourth vaccine also uh, any vaccine for monkeypox as well yeah uh, see currently uh, the, the the good thing about this pox viruses group as such is that you have cross protection from one pox virus to the other pox virus uh, in fact that has been uh, uh, you know uh, that that advantage has been taken and that's how we prepared uh, a uh, uh, vaccine basically the currently the vaccine what we have available is from the vaccinia strain basically this is been uh, you know uh, used during the month, uh, during the smallpox time which has been eradicated in 1980 uh, so this is also one of the other uh, uh, other group of this same pox virus uh, if you have uh, you know immunity to this one you will have a cross protection against uh, you know other like you know uh, smallpox or monkeypox basically this thing has this characteristic has been exploited and that's how we are using as vaccine currently we have two vaccines mind you this is not yet available in the country this is in the us in the united states they are using this genios vaccine and ecam 2000 these are the two vaccines uh, genios is the one which is a non replicating form of uh, uh, live vaccine and uh, ecam 2000 is a replicating form genios seems to be have less side effects compared to the ecam 2000 and basically these are all developed for the you know smallpox but now fda has given approval for even to protect against monkeypox because of its cross protection efficacy 
these two are available in the us we don't have available as of now in the country but i think i've seen in the news that already a lot of companies are uh, you know uh, uh, doing you know uh, research and trying to make a molecule i'm seeing in the newspaper i haven't seen a direct publication somewhere but i'm seeing here i i'm, I'm sure that probably we'll see uh, recently in our country too deepak i wanted to actually put a comment on this vaccination see i think uh, those who are elderly more than 40 years uh, i don't know ki most of them must have been vaccinated for smallpox um, i think i was just checking for myself whether i was vaccinated for smallpox or not i am 42 43 uh, i think at the, around that period from 1975 to 80 the, the smallpox was considered eradicated and the vaccination was almost uh, was stopped everywhere uh, it may vary from one country to other so those who got a smallpox vaccination uh, before this 40 years if you take account they may have some uh, maybe immunity or a, a cross immunity as uh, pointed out by vishnu but those uh, who actually were born after uh, maybe 1980 or on uh, they are not vaccinated and this smallpox vaccines are available in at industry level for maybe protection so they are all there so you know, many of us believe they can be useful but do we really need at this point of time to vaccinate common population is a question except maybe the high risk group or those groups which uh, where the cases clusters are there um, maybe i will uh, keep a eye with a vigilance watch on that not actually um, uh, maybe making this vaccine uh, being a norm for the normal public uh uh vishnu to what you take on that uh, smallpox right i'm like those who got actually smallpox in the previous maybe uh, yeah see uh, one, one more thing is that now in us they are giving these vaccines within 14 days of exposure uh, you know within 14 days of the exposure to the high risk group those who has contacts and all within 14 days they are giving if you ask the cross protection with the smallpox vaccine uh, the data is there that you can have cross protection for up to 15 to 20 years uh, uh with this vaccine but after that we really don't know how much it cross protection is going to offer but if you see the case series which has been published there are few cases i think in the 20s or 30 cases in those big list which has been published there who, who are a uh, smallpox vaccinated uh, when they were in 70s or 80s uh, you know but still they also got it so the cross protection we know data is up to 15 to 20 20 years uh, uh with the smallpox and after that we really don't know and we have cases in those case series which who got a uh, smallpox in uh, smallpox vaccination actually yeah thank you uh, samidam sir one question for you uh, if at all someone has a covid or maybe in the past they had a covid uh, any difference with the other patients when you have a monkeypox i i didn't understand the question uh, for example someone had a covid we are all afraid of covid in the past and uh, some people like us, we had two times, three times COVID as <laughs> So does it make a difference in, when someone gets a monkeypox? Are there more risk or something like that? Uh, well, I don't think uh, that uh, may be a situation. However, there is a small uh, cohort of COVID patients who have long COVID. Uh, these are patients who have immunomodulation because of the long COVID. Long COVID has a lot of manifestations. There are CNS manifestations, cardiac manifestations. There are immunological manifestations also. So if those patients are uh, involved and they're also having some kind of an immunomodulatory, immunosuppressing disease, like a diabetes, like a CKD, like a chronic liver disease, then it is likely that this disease could be more severe. I'm not sure from data. There is not much published data on this, but I'm just hypothesizing that just as you get, uh, you know, varicella in a very uh, exuberant form in transplant recipients, uh, you may get this also. I'm not sure, but that is a hypothesis. But if you've got COVID four times, uh, one monkeypox is not should not shake you. Uh, um, maybe uh, if you have survived four episodes of COVID nothing else will touch you so uh, you should be very happy uh, and <laughs> just take it I, I think the uh, even the data at this point of time says the same way sir the long covid are the uh, patients where they are more watchful and uh, right now there is no uh, clear evidence but they are more concerned on the long covid than just take covid recovery true yeah, i think that's the next pandemic what we are going to see in the next 4 years is long COVID. That is going, 
when you take history from a patient with mi to the history Come of a stroke then diabetes hypertension hyperthyroid ckd the fifth one you'll ask is colon it's going to become like that so this disease also will become part of that so samayam sir last question for you uh, again what are the realistic chance of this becoming a outbreak at a larger scale the who has already declared it as an outbreak of international concern so it's already an outbreak but for a layman uh, like what do we need to understand by that but one case is a outbreak yes. by definition <laughs> yeah no no for a rare disease in india like monkeypox having eight cases in a span of two weeks is a big number no so if, see i can't as a medical professional say don't worry i will be failing in my duty if i don't caution people that you could get you are get yourself exposed to an unwanted and avoidable uh, disease right um it is already an outbreak and but it is in your hands to control it so be vigilant uh, be careful and listen to what the government agencies are telling you please thank you sir uh, we have come to the conclusion of our uh, like awareness program dr vishnu take home message from you uh take home message okay yeah i, I think i mean uh, currently the disease is uh, you know uh, it's not many cases been reported but already everything has been discussed i uh, you know what all we have told that are the take home messages so first most important thing is that if you have a suspicion always you know meet your healthcare worker and uh, you need to get isolated and uh, you know just meet the healthcare worker he will take care but don't try to you know diagnose do self diagnosis at home i think that's all my uh, take home i don't really have much to tell yeah thank you sir for a public that uh, a general public participation yeah just because we have seen a very devastating pandemic in the last two years uh, don't uh, extrapolate the, that kind of fear to this there is no need to really get panic about the cases which we are seeing right now maybe the last two three months uh, yes we need to be vigilant we need to be watchful we need to be doing what we responsibly need to do in this uh, case of monkey pox i strongly believe we can contain this disease uh, in a better way than what uh, we have not able to do in a covid thank you sir samadam sir you already told the listen to the government and medical professionals any other take home yeah i would only add to what both vishnu and venkat have said the uh, what we saw during the first wave of covid nobody knew what worked somebody said chloroquine works somebody said ivermectin works right so people started hoarding these drugs in their houses they started hoarding oxygen cylinders in their houses to the point that people who had malaria did not have access to chloroquine to the point that people who had rheumatoid arthritis did not have access to chloroquine and to the point that worm infestation people could not have access to ivermectin and those who really required oxygen because of interstitial lung disease heart failure did not have oxygen so don't go now searching for pseudo uh, pseudo covid Uh, wherever it is and hold it in your house as vishnu reassuringly told us you don't need it but leave it for those who need it in the market this is all like a react to what uh, the other two learned speakers have already spoken uh thank you sir uh it has been a pleasure to interact with you and uh, our again sincere thanks for you uh, three of you for sparing your time and our sincere thanks to the iccm hyderabad at the national level uh, for giving us the opportunity so to close the webinar our three or four message we all in a simpler terms uh, as of now we know a little things about the disease but we know enough that there is nothing too scary about like to worry about like a covid uh, pandemic last time so just be reassured follow what your doctors are saying and follow the government guidelines as of now it looks like a milder disease with uh, most of the cases almost all of the cases are self limiting so i mean like maybe uh, you don't uh, go frightening and go worry about it and i think uh, we hope for the best and we hope the vaccines also come thank you thank you thank you sir good day thank you good day bye bye thank you sir so we are closing here thank you